Today's Bible reading is John chapter 6, verses 22 through to 59. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realised that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realised that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and you still do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling amongst yourselves, Jesus answered. No one comes to me unless the father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Thank you for reading, Kate, and it's a great privilege to have Kate reading the Bible. Kate and I actually grew up together uh, way back, I won't say how long ago, but let's just say late 70s, early 80s, so I've known her a long time, and it's great that she can read the Bible and I have the privilege of preaching on it. The US journalist Alfred Henry Lewis once said, that there are only nine meals between humanity and anarchy. 
There are only nine meals between humanity and anarchy. You see, unlike many other commodities, food is the one thing that is essential. You can't put off having food. If there was a shortage, say, of shoes, then I would say most of us, maybe not all of us, could cope for a few months without buying new shoes. But food, of course, is vastly different if there were an interruption to our food supply. Fear would set into our culture immediately because of the simple fact that food is so intrinsically linked to life. After only nine missed meals, states Lewis, it's likely that there will be a panic and that many people, maybe even us, would be prepared to commit a crime to get food. After all, if there is no food, there is no life. And it is this very link between food and life that Jesus uses in our reading this morning to teach us what it means to entrust our lives fully to him. Now, there is so much happening in this passage, uh, and our time is somewhat limited. Uh, and I've been doing my best to keep this sermon under an hour now, what that means is we're not going to be able to cover all of the information and what's going on in this passage. So if I miss a bit that you are particularly excited about learning, I do apologise. I'm going to be focusing particularly on the first half of this reading and looking at this claim that Jesus makes, that he is the bread of life. So as we begin this story, notice firstly that Jesus reminds us that we are all spiritually hungry. We are all spiritually hungry. We find Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And just to give you a very quick kind of catch up on background where we are, last week, by the way, there was an excellent sermon by Mike Phillips on that passage. Have a listen, it's online. Uh, and he, that is Jesus, not Mike, has been preaching and healing the sick, gathering a crowd, there were 5,000 men, and when you add the women and the children, it comes to around 20,000 people, which is roughly the population of Carlton and Parkville combined. And we read last week that the crowd got hungry. They've been following around Jesus all day. There are no food vans. There's no Uber Eats. No one has brought a lunch except for this one kid with five loaves and two fishes in his lunchbox. Yet with this very small and humble lunch, Jesus is able to feed this crowd of 20,000 people. Now, understandably, the people are quite excited by this. They see Jesus' power and they want to make him king to kick out the Romans. But Jesus will have none of this and he withdraws and goes over to the other side of the lake and the crowd are looking for him. And this is where we pick up our story in verse 25. And the crowd asked Jesus, Rabbi, when did you get here? Now, by the way, this is actually not the real question that they want to ask. This is the polite question you ask before you ask the real question. It's the icebreaker. But Jesus knows the real question, what's really happening in their hearts. Have a look at verse 26. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. You've had a free lunch, and now you want another one. And the reason this is such a big deal is because we have refrigerators and they don't have refrigerators. In other words, for most people, they would have to make their own food, their own bread, new each day. Now, one thing I've noticed uh, due to the internet and social media is that there has been a lot of ISO baking going on. Uh, put your hand up, uh, let, give us a big shout out if you've been doing some ISO baking. I've got no idea, by the way, if you're doing it, but I'm going to assume that some of you have said yes and nodded in your, in your lounge rooms. Uh, that's been a kind of trendy thing to do. But here are people doing baking because they have to. It's a necessity. It is their literal daily bread. So bread is not just 
uh, an extra. It is something that is core to what they need. And so what Jesus has done is then is use that bread as a metaphor to explain, yes, they might be, might be physically hungry, but the big issue is that they are spiritually hungry, but they're eating the wrong food. Have a look at what Jesus says in verse 27. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man, which is Jesus' name for himself, will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. See, what Jesus is doing very insightfully with this crowd is saying, yes, I know you're physically hungry, but you have a deeper need. You have a spiritual hunger. There is something that you are chasing after, that you deeply long for, that you think that if you have it, it will give you fulfillment. It will give your life meaning. And friends, it's the same question is actually directed at us. What are you spiritually hungry for? How will you know when your life has been fulfilled? What truly gives our lives meaning? And friends, we chase after all kinds of things. We feed our, our, our souls with all kinds of things. It can be study or work. You can be hungry for success or achievement. I used to work uh, for a bank uh, before I was a minister, and people there would work ridiculous hours. And what they would do is, to, to show the boss just how hard they were working, they would make sure they would send an email at four in the morning just to show the boss, this is how hard I am working. Give me some recognition. Give me a pay rise. This is before the GFC, and so there were people on lots of money who were quite young. And when I spoke to them, sure, they had a lot of money and a lot of influence, but yet they felt empty. They were desperate. It was like something more seemed promise. You can be hungry for approval and success, but it will not fill you up. Maybe you are hungry and seeking approval through your children. You want your kids to have a fulfilled life. They want to speak, you want them to speak four languages, to play three sports and five musical instruments, to do drama and ballet. By the way, I'm not like that. I don't mind what my... Uh, sport my kids play uh, as long as they play for Australia that's the only pressure I have on my kids now, now don't get me wrong here it, it is important that we work hard on our study and that we take our work extremely serious and that we love our kids but if we think these are the things that will satisfy our spiritual hunger then what Jesus says is that we are working for food that spoils Boris Becker was a famous tennis player who I kind of got to know as I grew up, not to go personally, but was a real icon when I was growing up. He was the youngest person, youngest male to win Wimbledon. And this is what he says. He says, I had won Wimbledon twice before, once as the youngest player. I was rich. I had all the material possessions I needed. It's the old song of movie stars and pop stars who commit suicide. I had everything, yet I was so unhappy. I had no inner peace. I was a puppet on a string. And I think uh, Boris Becker is not the only one who has that sense of emptiness the echoes of a hollow life, chasing things that actually don't fill us up. So why don't these things fill us up? Why is Jesus' words just so insightful? Well, they don't fill us up for two reasons. Firstly, they're junk food. There's no real nutrients there. We are, we are a generation that are truly consumers, but will never feel fully fulfilled. We just keep eating junk. And the reason for this is the second point. This food actually doesn't give us eternal life. No matter how successful or rich or famous, 
no matter how well our kids uh, go, no matter how much our parents approve of us, we still die. In spite of the best medical care in the world, we can't escape our mortality. And the recent COVID-19 pandemic has made us even perhaps more aware of this reality. You see, our songs long for something eternal, and the best we can do is give it junk food, like Floss's leftover sandwich and banana. Oh, that was disgusting. Yet they're the things that we eat to try and satisfy our spiritual hunger, to give us life. You see, we are all hungry for something spiritually. And secondly, the only thing that will actually satisfy our spiritual hunger turns out to be a gift. A gift. You see, Jesus' followers are understandably keen to find and work out where there is this everlasting food that Jesus speaks of. Have a look at verse 28. They ask him, well, what must we do to get the work, to do the works that God requires? What do we have to do to get this bread, this food? See, the crowd thinks that when it comes to God, it's a market economy, an exchange of goods. We do this for God and we get this in return. That's kind of our basic understanding of religion. You do certain things. You go to church. You're committed. You laugh at the vicar's jokes and God rewards you. But the key bit we learn here is that when it comes to God, there is no market economy. There is just grace. There is just a gift. Look at verse 27 again, just the last bit. Do not work for food that spoils, but food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Will give you. It's a gift. So you don't earn your way to eternal life. It is given to you free of charge. You see, true satisfaction, true fulfillment is not found in material things. It's not found in religion. It is, in fact, offered to you as a gift, says Jesus. And it is a gift from Jesus. Well, how do then we receive this gift? Well, Jesus says, thirdly, that we receive this gift by entrusting our lives completely to the Lord Jesus, who is the bread of life. See, the crowd are still a bit puzzled by what Jesus said. And so in verse 28, they ask, well, what must we do to do the work that God requires? And Jesus gives a very profound answer. He says in verse 29, the work of God is this. He says, you want to know what you have to do to receive the gift of eternal life, to have spiritual fulfillment? This is what you have to do. To believe in the one he has sent to believe in the one he has sent in other words to entrust your life in its entirety to the lord jesus that and that alone is how we receive eternal life but the crowd need a bit more convincing entrust your life to jesus well well if that is true then jesus has to be trustworthy So they ask in verse 30, well, what sign then will you give us so that we can see it and believe you? What will you do? If you want us to believe you, to entrust our lives to you, well, at least give us a sign to prove that you are somebody who is worth entrusting our lives to. Now, this is is an almost humorous moment if it wasn't so sad. They're asking for a sign. What has just happened? What have they just seen? Uh, 5,000 men plus 15,000 women and children fed by a tiny lunchbox. They've just seen a miracle. They've just seen a sign. But you see, there's actually one particular miracle that they want. We see in verse 31. Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven 
to eat. See, what's going on here is they're comparing Jesus to Moses. Moses is a very big deal for God's people. And there was a promise made that there would be a prophet who would be like Moses. And Moses, in the story of the Exodus, gave the people bread each day, manna from heaven, for 40 years. And it's like these people are saying, look, Moses did that. Jesus, if you can top what, Jesus, uh, what Moses did, then we'll entrust our lives to you. Then we'll believe in you. Moses did it for 40 years. You've done it once. You need to up the ante. But the irony is, of course, that the crowd have completely missed the very sign they are asking for. They actually fail to understand what the feeding of this crowd is really about. See, it's not just a sign of Jesus' power as the Messiah, which it is. And it's not just a sign that he is a new and more powerful Moses, which it also is. But crucially, it's a sign of Jesus' mission as a Messiah, as God's chosen King. See, if Jesus wanted to do a miracle to show that he is the powerful son of God, can I dare suggest he could have done something far more impressive? Look, feeding 5,000 men plus 15,000 women to it, impressive. But this is something more impressive. So what he could have done is kind of launched off Superman style and flown through the air to Rome, the center of the empire and then he could have landed in the middle of the Colosseum in front of all the senators and the emperor and booted out the emperor and said guess what guys I am now the king Jesus has his power right he has power more than all the infinity stones put together he could do something dramatic like that But what happens here crucially is that we see that Jesus' miracles are not just a sign of his power, but they are a sign of what he came to use his power to do. In other words, they're a sign not that Jesus is just the Messiah, but they also point to what this Messiah's mission is. And so what Jesus does now is kind of uh, dig away at their assumptions by challenging them. And, and the first thing he says is, look, you've got it wrong. Moses didn't actually give the bread. God gave the bread. Have a look at verse 32. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. You're attributing the glory to the wrong person. And secondly, um, he says, look, Moses may have given you bread, but I give you life. Look at verse 33. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. See, what Jesus is doing here is turning the bread into a metaphor. Bread is the staple of all human diet in Jesus' time. It's a symbol of nourishment and sustenance. It's a symbol of life itself. The manna had to be coming down once each day because it only lasted a day. It, it went off just like that food in Floss's bag. And it was just for God's people. But Jesus gives life a once-for-all life, a once-for-all blessing, and not just for God's people, the Israelites. Notice, he gives life to the world. Somehow the Gentiles are going to be included in this life-giving mission as well. And thirdly, Jesus doesn't just give bread, Jesus is the bread of life. Verse 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me 
will never be thirsty. See, what Jesus is saying here is he is the source of life. Not just of eternal existence, but of eternal life in all its fullness and all its beauty. Jesus is the source of true fulfillment. This is really important, you see. Jesus doesn't give the crowd advice. He doesn't tell them where they can find the bread. He doesn't give them a cookbook and tell them how they can bake the bread. He doesn't give them a guide to life and say, look, if you follow these rules, you will have a fulfilled life. You will have eternal life. Now he says, I give you myself as the bread of life. Jesus is the bread. And Jesus repeats this very powerful idea throughout the rest of this entire narrative. In verse 41... I am the bread that came down from heaven. In verse 48, I am the bread of life. In verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Verse 55, my flesh is real food. In other words, time and time again, as he engages with the crowd and as his word comes to us, he is saying, guess what, guys? I am the one who brings life. I don't point you to the one who brings life. I am the one who brings life. I am the bread of life. Believe in me. Entrust yourselves to me. But this, of course, leaves a question. How can Jesus be the bread of life? It's an extraordinary claim. Well, there's actually an answer for us in verse 48. And it's a very ironic answer. See, Jesus becomes the bread of life by dying for us. He gives his life, he gives us life by dying for us. Have a look at verse 48. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna, that's the the bread that came down each day in the wilderness, yet they died. In other words, the bread was good for a day, but it didn't give eternal life. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. It's an entirely different category of bread. It is life-giving bread. Then verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. In other words, it's me. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And this is the key bit right at the end. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Do you hear what Jesus said? This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. You see, when Jesus is speaking here about giving his flesh for the life of the world, he's speaking about his death. Our flesh is the thing that can be harmed. It is the thing that makes us mortal. And Jesus, using this very powerful metaphor, is saying, the reason I have come down, the reason I have become flesh, is so that I can die. And that by dying, you can have life. You see, it is through Jesus' death, his crucifixion, being nailed to a wooden cross, that he wins for us forgiveness. That he pays the price of our sin and rebellion against God. The very thing that's led us to be spiritually hungry is the fact that we've walked away from God. And so Jesus dies our death so that we can have his life. We haven't got time, but notice how Jesus in both 40 and 44 speaks about this great promise that he will raise up those who entrust him on that last day. In other words, death will not be the end. He is the bread that gives eternal life. And therefore the call for us is to entrust our lives 
to Jesus. To feed on him, to make him the centre of what we do. To make him the thing that, that we shape and focus our entire life around. That is what it means to feed upon Jesus as a bread of life. And why is this so important? Well, because there's no other food available that will give you eternal life. Friends, if you are not a follower of Jesus yet, can I firstly say, we are so glad, as Fiona said, that you can join us online. But can I encourage you, perhaps now is the time to entrust your life to Jesus. Now is the time to embrace the eternal life that is offered to you in him. It's simply a matter of accepting the gift that Jesus gives. To acknowledge that we have all sinned, including uh, you and me, and walked away from God. That we've not been living his way. And to accept the bread of life, which means we are forgiven and have eternal life. Now is the time to eat of this life-giving bread. If you'd like to know more about exploring who this Jesus is, can I encourage you, click on that little connect button up the top there. We're running courses called Christianity Explored, which gives you a chance to investigate this Jesus who brings life. If you are already a follower of Jesus, maybe this passage can remind you to stop eating junk food. Stop working for food that spoils. Because if you're like me, your heart will start to hunger for things that are not the Lord Jesus. Because they're in nice, shiny wrappers. They promise a sugar hit. But they offer no eternal fulfillment. Bit of self disclosure. Uh, I've noticed that during uh, the coronavirus and isolation, there are two things that I've become more of in the negative sense. I've become more worried and I've become more angry. More prone to worry and more prone to feeling angry. I wonder if you are similar. If you are feeling worried or anxious or overwhelmed, here's the question that Jesus asks. And he asks me as much as he asks you. What are you feeding on? What are you making in your life more important than the Lord Jesus? So the answer to being worried and anxious and overwhelmed is not just telling yourself, stop worrying. It doesn't work when you just say, stop worrying. No, the answer is to make Jesus your life. To work out which part of your life you have not entrusted to him. Maybe you are angry and bitter and more prone to flying off the handle than you were. Once again, it's the same question. What are you making in your life more important than Jesus? Because once again, the answer, just stop being angry, isn't going to work. No, the answer is, make Jesus your life. What is it in your life that you have yet to entrust to Jesus? What spiritual junk food are you snacking on in the hope that it will give you fulfillment? Friends, we have the Lord Jesus, the bread of life. You have the food that endures to, inter uh, endures to internal life. So friends, make Jesus your life. Entrust yourself to him completely. Feed on him in your heart with thanksgiving. There may be nine meals between humanity and and anarchy, but friends, there is only one meal between humanity and eternal life. And that is entrusting ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Before we sing our next song, which is actually a prayer that we would do just this thing that the Lord Jesus would take our lives 
and help us to serve him. I'm going to pray that we will feed on the Lord Jesus, the bread of life. Our gracious Father, you know that far too often and our spiritual hunger we seek to feed upon things that spoil, that do not fill us up. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, the bread of life, who through his love gave his life and died for us that we may live. Ensuring that our sins are forgiven. Ensuring that we have eternal life. Father, may we entrust our entire life to him and feed on him the bread of life. Amen.